in-flight refueling was tricky at best. The early aerial tankers were powered by piston engines with a maximum speed little more than the stalling speed of the jet bombers. Here, the Y model negotiates the delicate task. Jet tanker refueling was obviously preferable and safer. It was only with the arrival of the KC-135 Stratotanker that aerial refueling became relatively safe and practical. One other method of increasing range was the adoption of extra-large outboard wing tanks, like this example, which can hold 3,000 gallons and can be jettisoned in a combat situation. By March 1954, B-52s were rolling off Boeing's production line in Seattle. The planes then went into an induction program where air crew and aircraft were blended into one fighting machine. Inside this sleek shape, crews of six men learned the ways of the Strato Fortress. After the B-36, they found Boeing's bomber much more cramped. Every available inch had been dedicated to fuel, payload and electronics. Where the Peacemaker had no less than six gun positions, the B-52 had only one. The plane relied on its performance and the new science of radar jamming for its self-defense. The Strategic Air Command had to have the world's best bomber. B-52 is a great plane because I like flying it. It was a fun plane to fly. One of the most challenging things about it was refueling it. You get a plane that big, you know, 500,000 pounds behind a a tanker that's 350,000 pounds and you got to transfer 120,000 pounds of fuel. That's, a, that's a part of the things that, that make it a great plane. It, it can go and go and go. I never got to fly it, but they used to fly 24-hour uh, missions in B-52s, just refuel. So I think what makes a great plane a great plane were all the crews that flew it over so many years, you know. My father was too old to fly it. I'm one of the younger people flying it myself, but uh, there are probably... 25 years old that are flying into their planes 10 years older now. Now, back to Wings on the Discovery Channel. The Strategic Air Command made the same heavy demands of its crews that it did of its new B-52 bombers. Crew members were trained until they became an elite corps of professionals, forming a team equal to the sophisticated new aircraft they flew. For over 10 years, the Strato Fortress and its crew had one primary responsibility, carrying and delivering the thermonuclear hydrogen bomb. But if the bomb was to be carried as a deterrent, it had to be tested to prove its potential. Throughout the 1950s, hydrogen bombs were detonated in remote Pacific regions. The last tests, like many before, used B-52s to drop the deadly payloads. destructive device ever conceived by the human mind is a matter of precision and routine. A specialist hauling job for the highly trained members of the Strategic Air Command team. Each cargo has a 100 megaton yield, 100 times greater than the bombs dropped on Japan.
Unlike the weapons of the Second World War, the device carried in this bomb bay will be slowed in its drop from the B-52 by a parachute, allowing the bomber more time to vacate the area before the cataclysmic explosion. Fearing a Soviet atomic attack, America set up an elaborate array of early detection facilities during the Cold War years. The early warning systems were based mainly in the frozen north, the most likely route of a first strike. Radar watchers constantly monitored scanners that probed the sky, looking for the blip that might signal the beginning of World War III. Strategic Air Command had fleets of B-52s on operational standby, in a constant state of alert, ready to act as the ultimate deterrent if needed. When the red phone rang, the procedure was automatic. Up to 100 strato fortresses could be dispatched in a few short minutes. The routine was finely tuned by regular exercise. The concept of an instant retaliatory strike by SAC was seen as the nation's best defense during the Cold War years. The business of nuclear deterrence was trusted only to carefully screened officers. All nuclear armed B-52 pilots held at least the rank of major they bore the heavy responsibility of commanding aircraft that could change or even end life on Earth. Just as jets replaced piston engines, so the B-52 and its high-flying Soviet counterparts were superseded by an efficient and very deadly new technology that was born in Nazi Germany. By the early 1960s, ground-to-air missiles had been perfected by the U.S. and the Soviets to the point where massive nuclear bombardment by aircraft would be difficult to achieve. The emphasis had shifted to another form of delivery, Intercontinental Ballistic Missiles. Years of development had produced the Polaris and Minuteman missiles, among other forms of rocketry, which meant that manned flights over enemy airspace were no longer necessary to wage full-scale nuclear war.
but Sack Strato fortresses were kept in service. They still had a major role to play in the dangerous game of nuclear brinkmanship. For the trouble with ICBMs was that once launched, they could not be called back. This denied politicians the time-honored tactic of saber-rattling and further heightened the risk of international conflict. The B-52, used in conjunction with Hound Dog standoff bombs, provided a flexible alternative. B-52s could proceed to the very edge of enemy airspace, signaling America's readiness to attack, but still providing time for last-minute negotiations. The B-52's effectiveness was further increased by the development of the Quail Decoy, which confused enemy radar by mimicking a Strato Fortress radio signal. Further development after the Hound Dog produced the SRAM missile. Small and able to be carried in greater numbers, the SRAM could be guided from within the B-52 to targets up to 100 miles away with devastating accuracy. In 1965, the B-52 was used for the first time in Vietnam. Now it carried conventional bombs instead of nuclear warheads, but it remained a deadly weapon. The wing mounts now carried 24 500-pound iron bombs. The internal bomb load brought the total payload of each plane up to a total bomb load of 108. course of the Strato Fortress's involvement in Southeast Asia, B-52s dropped in excess of three million tons of bombs. Although the use of the high-flying bombers was controversial at the time, there is little doubt that the Strato Fortress was very effective when used for conventional bombing. Many historians argue that the heavy bombing of North Vietnam during the linebacker operations pushed the enemy back to the negotiating table and eventually resulted in ceasefire. Their Vietnam operations, more sophisticated bombs were dropped. Some could be detonated later by personnel in other aircraft using infrared viewing equipment to coincide an explosion with enemy activity. Standard 500 and 750 pound iron bombs like these were used on most B-52 raids. facilitate quick loading and turnaround, the internal bomb load was contained in pre-arranged racks so they could be installed in the shortest possible time. 